It's my aim uh, in the time I've got allocated to make you really thrill to the sound of legislation and get really excited about all of that. Now, that may sound strange, but uh, my professional background actually is in culture, arts, and creative industries. And so my slightly circuitous route to this subject has gone via many different points, but the most relevant here, as uh, Shamir has already indicated, is fashion. So one of the things that I've been doing whilst I've been in the House of Lords, and I know fashion and House of Lords don't necessarily sound very sort of together, but one of the things I've done is to establish a group looking at ethics and sustainability in fashion. Now, prior to the collapse of the Rana Plaza building in Bangladesh in 2013, I think it was, um, there was still, a, there was a movement around ethical fashion, but I think that really concentrated people's minds as to what was going on in the supply chains and fashion. So that was a huge impetus to do something. And as a result, there've been many uh, movements uh, around that, trying to promote the idea of ethical and sustainable fashion. Um, meanwhile, um, legislation around uh, modern slavery, and I think many of us have come to accept that term, encompasses a wide range of abusive practices and forms of exploitation. That kind of movement has gone forward as well, maybe a little bit slowly to begin with. So when I was first involved in, in legislation in this area in 2009, there was a very reluctant Labour government actually didn't really want to take on this issue of what was happening here in Britain, in the UK. But since then, since 2009, there's been a gathering of momentum. And I'm pleased to say that having met people like Shamir and various other colleagues working in a wide range of industries, it's been really heartening to see how that um, impetus has, has really kind of taken off. And I think Cindy uh, from the Ethical Trading Initiative maybe also would, would agree with that, I would hope so. There's been a surge of interest. And I think legislation is part of that. I always say that legislation is actually quite a blunt instrument, so it kind of time does things in quite a clunky way. But actually, what it also does is to create a particular kind of culture, a particular kind of atmosphere, which means that people have to think about it, even if they eventually they sort of think, oh, no, I'm not interested, can't be bothered, not going to do anything about it. The fact that it's there is, has meant that people have to think about it. So what I want to do is to address um, three very simple questions. Why should business do anything on modern slavery? How can business prevent um, uh, exploitation? And what... Uh, can be done in business. Now, obviously, again, I'm not in business, and I'm particularly, you know, I would say I know very little, if anything, about the business uh, types of businesses with which you're engaged. But as I've already said, fashion is one, one of my passions, but also football, as I bored Shamir with when we met um, at the house a few weeks ago. And uh, so another group that I'm currently setting up in Parliament is a group that's going to be looking at mega sporting events and human rights. Now, as many of you will be aware, um, that was sharply brought into focus um, in terms of human rights abuses when we learned of the deaths of workers in Qatar as they prepare for the uh, World Cup in 2022 we think. Um, but um, uh, quite apart from that, there are a number of Premier League football clubs, um, Chelsea, Spurs and Liverpool, I think spring to mind, who are in the process of thinking about or engaging with this idea of extending their um, uh, stadium. So um, it is an issue that kind of, the construction industry obviously goes across a wide range of other businesses. In addition to that, um, I've got a private member's bill, and I don't know how up you all are around the kind of parliamentary lingo, but what that essentially means is I'm trying to change the law from within Parliament, trying to get the government to strengthen Section 54, which is um, Section 54 of the Modern Slavery Act, which is transparency in supply chain reporting. So that's my fixation at the moment. It's the thing with which I bore all my friends and, and uh, uh, colleagues and, and so on, how to get uh, Section 54 really working well, because I think it can be a really good mechanism. So why, and I think the why is... It, it, also contains this issue, it must be more than a tick box exercise. And when you look at some of the statements, I mean, I would be ashamed 
to be, I'm not going to name and shame here, but there are, I would be ashamed to be some of the businesses that have produced statements, nine sentences. How can you possibly address those guidelines that are set out in Section 54 to look at, for example, training, organisational structure, the uh, structure of the supply chains, etc., etc. How can you possibly give all that information in nine sentences? You can't. I'm not saying necessarily that the longer it is, the better it is, but there are some that are really go into detail and really clearly thought through um, this issue, and I think it's really important to um, make sure that it isn't just a tick box um, exercise. Now, one of the spurs to action, I think, the why is one of the prods, if you like, around the why, is what's happening around the world in terms of the thoughts that are going on in very different jurisdictions about um, this particular issue and how, um, broadly speaking, supply chains can be scrutinized by the companies themselves in order to um, try and make sure that there is as little forced labor, um, exploitative labor as possible. Now, I don't know, I would probably say that it was virtually impossible to be 100% um, uh, sure of that. And, th and that's another thing that I've seen in a couple of statements. We can guarantee there is no slavery or forced labour. And you think, how? How can you possibly do that? I don't think it is uh, possible. And I think that it is, it's really important to say that those of us who work with uh, NGOs and certainly myself in Parliament, we're not here to kind of beat people about the head and say, if you don't do this, we're going to name and shame you. Or if you find this in your supply chain, we're going to have a big sort of movement against you. That isn't the objective of the exercise, in my view. The objective is to make people think about what they're doing and to look at the implications of, of what's going on in their supply chains. So as I say, you know, we've now got um, various structures around human rights and business, pr principally the UN guiding principles. Um, there are also uh, the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and, and human rights. And then there's other uh, jurisdictions such as um, uh, Germany, I believe, is looking at some um, legislation in this area. We've got our own Modern Slavery Act, which in turn was built on the California Transparency and Supply Chains um, Act, um, which was really the groundbreaking piece of legislation that others have followed and, and built on. There are Dutch uh, child labor due diligence laws. There's a French corporate duty of vigilance law. Um, and there's various other frameworks that are coming into play. Australia is considering um, uh, some more legislation. Canada is considering more legislation in this area. So as, as people become aware of the huge impact of this scourge on uh, communities, societies and individuals and nations indeed, and particularly in de um, developing countries, as people become more aware of that and businesses' role, businesses' complicity in some um, cases in that, so this issue of legislation becomes more pressing. So um, that, that should be an incentive for people to think about um, this particular um, issue. And to me, it's part of a whole suite of legislation that's sort of linked together. If we put together the issues around bribery, around paying, <coughs> excuse me, appropriate tax, environmental issues, all of these are part of that kind of, <coughs> excuse me, for those of you who, oh, was that yours? That was mine, thank you. Uh, for those of you who read books um, or are interested in fiction, you might be aware of why I'm slightly sore-throated this morning and uh, um, a little bit um, sort of under the weather, I would say. However, no excuses, as I really feel very strongly about this uh, work. So, you know, I know it's a bit of a cheesy thing to say, but if you're not part of the solution, then I don't think it's that you're part of the problem, you are the problem. And I think a lot of businesses have woken up to this, but find it quite difficult to know how to um, uh, proceed with doing something that's really um, useful. What we don't want to do is introduce more legal instruments, because if you do that, then you've got to police them, you've got to monitor them, and actually, if we've got time, maybe in the Q&A, we can come back to that whole issue of monitoring and um, whether there should be punitive um, uh, solutions to this. But at the moment, uh, the government has taken a very softly, softly approach uh, to legislation, and we'd like it to stay that way. But I would say that people like me and others, um, if this doesn't work, then we will be crying for, clamoring for further, much more strict legislation. So I do think it's in the um, interest of business to try and make it work. 
I mentioned um, uh, my private members bill, and I'm sort of going to slot that in under the question how. So my private members bill, one of the big things in that, which I'm sure um, uh, you'll be interested in, is um, to bring in public bodies to this legislation. Now, you may be aware, you may have noticed that under Section 54, public bodies aren't um, uh, count accounted for in that legislation. And although there's masses of guidelines and regulations and all the rest of it, there isn't anything that consolidates what actions people, are um, organizations are taking in the same way that the um, transparency and supply chain reporting does. So that's a really important thing for me. And obviously, the kinds of content contracts that are available through public bodies is enormous. It's billions and billions of pounds. And therefore, there could be a real um, influence, I think, felt throughout the private sector as more and more contracts uh, go outside. So that's a really important part of it for me. Another important part, I've mentioned before how some of the reports are really quite pathetic, to be honest with you. Some of them are brilliant, I have to say. And I'd, is there anybody here from Marshalls today? Oh, okay. Well, so I can say it without embarrassing her then. That's great. Theirs is great. Have a look at theirs. It's really, really good. And there's a whole kind of uh, set of uh, layers underneath of the statement that actually give you confidence that here is a business that's really working hard to do this. Now, I'm not saying, oh, everybody's got to do something like Marshall's. Far from it. But it's just that level of thought um, that's gone into it that I think is really interesting to have a look at. So um, the other part of, um, another part of the private member's bill is to say that when you're writing your statements, um, those headings that are there, I think there's six or seven headings that ask you to give information in your report about what you're doing. Um, at the moment, it says you may do those if you want to. And I, I think you must do them. It's absolute minimum to say, you know, to describe your um, uh, supply chains, to look at your organisational structure, to say what kind of training you're giving to staff, and so on and so forth. So I think that's a really important thing. And in fact, just to give a little plug, I've got a campaign running which is called Let's Make It Work. And the essence of that is to say, let's make this piece of legislation work. Because as I said earlier, if it doesn't, we'll have to think about more stringent uh, possibilities. How am I doing for time? Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so also a big part of the how, and I know that you, you were talking about this earlier, is working together. And it's really interesting to me. As I say, I come from a completely different kind of sector to most of you here. But what I've seen is this kind of cross-sectoral collaboration can really pay off. So it's not just a question of, I think it's really important to have within your own sector your own meetings and share experiences and share um, of what you've done in regard to transparency and supply chain reporting. But I also think it's useful to have this cross-sectoral um, approach too. So there are several groups that help facilitate that. I think ETI is one of them. The UN Global Compact uh, Network is another. Also so working with the, um, uh, Brit uh, the Business and Human Rights um, Consortium and the Institute for Human Rights and Business. There are a number of bodies that help people and give support uh, to companies who want to work together and can facilitate that. And of course, there are many different stakeholders in all of this, as has already been mentioned, there's trade unions, NGOs, don't think of NGOs as your enemies or as the people who are out to get you and expose your terrible practices to the press. The NG and certainly the NGOs with whom I've been working have been incredibly positive and constructive. And their aim, they want to make this work as well. We all want to make this work. And so it's really um, important, I think, to be able to work together. And in fact, far from doing all this naming and shaming, it's looking at examples of good practice, looking at the different ways in which people can get together and share their experiences and practices in a fairly open and uh, non-competitive environment. And I think that's really important too. So you know, the third part is the what, you know, and it's a kind of call to action, which you, you know about really, you know what needs to be done, talking to colleagues, working on the gaps and the challenges that exist and not shying away uh, from them. Uh, there's a really vivid example that you gave earlier when you were talking about how people don't want to ask too many questions just because they think there's going to be something there. It's totally the wrong um, attitude and won't get us anywhere. And in the end, all you're doing is facilitating crimes. And who really wants to be implicated in some of the, I mean, everything uh, from a murder and um, sexual abuse and all, all the rest of the panoply of crimes that take place 
um, within, that can take place within uh, this area. Really, really, we do not want to be implicated in that. So we must be really diligent. And I think the more that people work together, the less likely it is that people can be sort of, um, that these criminals uh, can, can uh, win the day, as, as has already been uh, said. So it is really daunting. That's one of the things that um, I've come across from companies in the sectors that I've been talking to primarily. It's quite daunting because you think, oh my God, you're asking me to end modern slavery you know no it's not like that but as I say that's that working together we have to um, work out ways um, of collaborating and um, creating platforms for these uh, conversations that will sort of present a united front most of the companies that come to me will say I really really want this legislation to work we really support your private members bill because we want to do um, we want to do, run our business in a in an ethical way and so all of those people who are acting in an unscrupulous way are undermining our position so legislation has the legislation has to be made to work so I'm calling on the government absolutely to strengthen it so and if you felt like doing that you could do that too um, uh, so I think again, you know, just to um, uh, emphasise this point about collaboration, it's also about peer learning. And again, as I said before, there is that sort of issue of thinking across um, uh, different sectors. So um, the, uh, just to sort of uh, finish off, to me, there is a really important point which is about building on this momentum, because I think if we let it slide, there's a real danger that uh, people will get complacent and after a year they'll say, oh well, I'll just repeat the same statement as I put in last year, nobody's gonna be noticing. Well, I think I'm here to tell you that people will be noticing because I'm certainly gathering a whole range of people from NGOs and individuals and the general public in this campaign to make sure that people live up to the promise of this piece of legislation. It'll only be as good as the people, you people, and other businesses that care to implement it. And as I say, if it's not done, I hate to sort of sound like the head teachers come along with the big stick, but if it's not done, we're just going to have to improve on uh, punitive we're going to have to introduce some punitive measures and really get down to monitoring and naming and shaming. I hope we don't come to that. All the signs at the moment are that we won't need to, so I hope we can build on all the work that's been done by all the great institutions and government bodies, the NGOs, trade unions and civil society in order to make sure that we do uh, make Section 54 work. Thank you very much.